are welcome to this preview of the book of Genesis, chapter 6, for the Powellhurst Men's Study, the 9th of February, 2023, reading from the New International Version. We have these learning objectives for this chapter. First, to identify the mysterious sons of God, then to identify the ancient giants on the earth, to explain why God exterminated human beings, and then explain why Noah and his household were spared. Coming then to Genesis 6, 1 through 2, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. The term for human beings in Hebrew is ha-adam, meaning humankind. The sons of God in Hebrew, the b'nai ha-elohim, could be translated sons of the gods, for in this chapter the singular of deity is Yahweh. The term for married here is from a root that means to take, grasp, or seize. So is this talking about forced marriages or unnatural unions? Well, who were these sons of God or sons of the gods? There are a few main theories. Some say that these refer to ancient kings who began to practice polygamy, or perhaps ancient tribal chiefs and the right of the first night. We shall leave that unexplained. Others say this refers to the godly lineage of Seth, son of Adam, when these godly men began to marry pagan women. However, it seems unlikely that there ever was a godly lineage of Adam or any lineage that had only pagan women. The most likely interpretation is that of divine beings or some kind of angels who made use of human women. These divine beings may have been the angels who sinned according to the epistle of Jude, verse 6. For we have other mentions of the sons of God who were present at creation and are referenced in a meeting of the divine council in Psalm 82. In any event, it were these who engendered giants, or in Hebrew, Nephilim. Yahweh sets a limit on human lifespan. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. Yahweh affirms human mortality. Compare Hebrews 9 verse 27. It is counted unto every one once to die. The phrase, my spirit, recalls Genesis 2-7, when God breathed into Adam his breath, or spirit. The conjunction for, literally in Hebrew, in which also, might be translated since, since they are only flesh. A certain wisdom text from the town of ancient Emar cites 120 years as the most years given to humans by the gods. This seems to have been a common motif or belief amongst ancient peoples, perhaps learned from Noah. The watchers corrupt the human race. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went in to the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, 
warriors of renown. The Nephilim, translated in the Greek Septuagint by gigantes or giants. Elsewhere in the Bible, this term is used of tall, strong humans, as in Numbers 13. The term hero here means strong one or strong warrior. It was the Jewish book of Enoch that equated these with the so-called watchers, angels who watched human beings, who taught women to seduce and taught men to make war. Thus ancient Jews taught that demons are the souls of drowned giants. Human wickedness prevails. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humans was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. If you are meeting with a men's group, discuss this query. If Yahweh knows everything since the beginning, and he knew that free moral agents would go evil or commit sins, then why was he sorry when they did so, and why did he grieve over the outworking of his own plan? Talk about parents who know that young children might one day make wrong choices. Will those parents feel any less grieved when their children make those wrong choices? I will blot out humankind. So Yahweh said, I will blot out from the earth the humans I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Made here is the verb bara, which was used in the first creation account in Genesis chapter 1. If there were indeed two creations of two human races, then does this refer only to the first? Why the other creatures? Had they too been genetically corrupted by the watchers? Could the use of modern gene therapies so alter our human DNA that our race will no longer be eligible for redemption by Jesus' blood? What do you think? Righteous Noah finds grace with Yahweh. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The term here for find or to be found is from a root that can mean to find, reach, meet, obtain, or achieve. Righteous is the common term tzaddik, meaning righteous, just, true, pure, or perfect. And blameless, tamim, complete, unscathed, intact, or honest. So, was Noah's lineage pure bloods, unmixed with giants' DNA from the sons of God? And how could Noah walk with God outside of Eden? Discuss this amongst yourselves. Whilst humanity falls into wickedness. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. In the sight of, literally, to the faces of, or possibly in the face of Yahweh? Violence. The Hebrew term is the same as in Arabic, 
Hamas, and corrupted from a root meaning the pit or grave, hence to spoil, to ruin, even to miscarry. And the term for people is basar, literally flesh, that is, their physical being, but also in their ways, that is, their behavior. Yahweh prepares to start over. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. The term for ark, teva, is an Egyptian word meaning chest or sarcophagus, a great box-like structure. The term for cypress in Hebrew gopher is an unknown kind of wood. And the term pitch, kofer, a cognate term in the Akkadian language, kupru, was used of both pitch and asphalt. Notice that pitch and asphalt secure together for Moses' little ark in Exodus 2, verse 3. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. The Egyptian cubit is now known to have been about 20 inches long. There was also a Greek cubit of about 18 inches. Was Moses from Greece? Or was he from Egypt? Yahweh makes a covenant with Noah. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. A covenant Berit in Hebrew, is any kind of agreement, sometimes treaties between nations, contracts between individuals. Such agreements may be imposed by sovereigns, such as emperors, upon vassals, that is, kings whom they have conquered. All of Yahweh's dealings with humans is by his covenants and his promises. Jesus and the New Testament make reference to Noah, to the ark, to the flood. As it was in the days of Noah, Jesus said, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. The day Noah entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. And the Apostle Peter, in his first epistle, wrote, The imprisoned spirits were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved. So, if Jesus and the New Testament affirm the flood, and if there was no such flood, then what? Was Jesus wrong, deluded, or mistaken? Was Jesus accommodating to Jewish superstitions, knowing it was not true, but spoke about it anyway? 
Or do New Testament books pass off old myths as truth? Thus, can we safely reject the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the New Testament? Then what should we conclude about worldwide flood accounts and the massive skeletal deposits found around the world? And if Yahweh destroyed the world once, then could he ever do so again? Will he?